Welcome to Bon Mats, where we'll be applying the Manzer or mostly Thurlow scale of quantitative analysis of pop culture narrative through a binary system. Or Mats! This podcast contains spoilers, mature content, and language. Viewer discretion advised. Hello, and welcome back to part two of our True Detective Season 2 overview. In this episode, we are going to be discussing a much better example of film noir. And uh, noir in general, I suppose, even though it'd be just... Cop corruption a, drama. A television, yeah. So, I'm Jonathan E. Manzer, here with Scott Thurlow. Hello. Stephen Ramosi. Hi. And would anyone like to give a brief summary of the fantastic movie L.A. Confidential? Well, since we're the, doing the series we're doing, I uh, came up with an okay one. I, I called it True True Detective. That is to say, better than True Detective itself. Absolutely. Uh, so... We're going to give a brief overview of our MOTS scores, but we're not going to do a traditional MOTS review. Uh, we're going to be analyzing character, because both True Detective Season 2 and LA Confidential are character-driven storylines. So, uh, Scott, what MOTS score did you give it? I gave it a perfect 10. One to everything. Steven? I also gave it a 10. And I, as well, gave it a 10. So, I, this, I think this is one of our highest-rated... Uh, movies, if not the highest rated movie we've as seen, as you well so should far. give it. A it 10. must be the highest rated movie, as it has a ten. Well, what do we give uh, Doctor Strange Love? Uh, was that one, a perfect ten? Emerge, someone uh, took out a version from Doctor Strange Love. Check that one out, though. Mm-hmm. But uh, and we gave a three point six six for uh, so these are polar opposites. Hmm. But in a sense, they're very similar movies. They're the same we're... story, and we'll tell you which one did which one better. Yeah, one part three. Mm. But we're, this one is going to be just a uh, kind of character analysis of uh, L.A. Confidential. So let's start with Bud White. All right, uh, Scott. What are you? What What was his arc? What was his characterization? Well, they start him off with he's like you know, the sort of the meathead cop, where he just goes like his introduction to his character is basically him. Uh, beating up a another guy who's abusing his wife in the house and he's like <laughs> they're on their way to the Christmas party first of all the, the annual cop Christmas party and he stops over just to uh, r- you know intimidate and rough this guy he said you know don't beat your wife again well come back here and that's ba- like so that's how you're introduced to him and his arc is uh, just a- actually an outright line in the movie where he's smarter than he sees or smarter than he appears smarter than he looks and he actually gets into doing if you will he's happy he's content to be the muscle of the force at first and he's content to also follow along to what the what the captain says and you know intimidate other criminals or would be criminals to keep them out. But then he realizes that he's being used, and he actually has a teams up with the his what should be his polar opposite when we'll get into Guy Pierce's character. But they team up together, and become actually almost perfect partners, and uh, root out the corruption and fight the corruption that they've uncovered. Well, they become the cliche of good cop bad cop. Yes, but, yeah, but they're effective at it. Yeah. <laughs> Steve? I yeah he you know he starts as the the like complete white knight character. It's really obvious that he has like a soft spot for you know damsels in distress but that type of thing yeah. Um, uh, and you know he seems like he is the kind of cop that will just do whatever he thinks is necessary to get the job done. He doesn't really care much about following things to the letter of the law, uh, like. Guy Pierce does his his opposite in the beginning, and you know, throughout the movie they kind of start to come closer to each other's middle, you know, mm, I agree which with that. is which is kind of a cool dynamic that I really liked. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I like his arc. He kind of goes against his own at at one point. He goes against his own um, code when he hits uh, Lynn. Lynn, his you know girlfriend, Veronica Lake. Right, his Veronica Lake lookalike girlfriend. Cool. So yeah, I mean, I thought he was a great uh, character, and he uh, and Russell Crowe did a good job of, of bringing him, you know, bringing that out in in him. Um, a lot of good lines, and you know, they 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 really brought him to life in the in the film. I really like Russell Crowe's like depiction of him. He's got the uh, kind of military cut Crew style. Cut, yeah. He's got a very like, kind of classic, um, but kind of cheap suit. <laughs> yeah, and. The looks on his face, like, it's almost as Russell Crowe is playing an extremely, like, dumb character. (laughs) All his, like, ways of acting really... All his mannerisms. Yeah, all his mannerisms really reflect this character who is kind of wanting to be smart, doubts himself, and 
runs more on instinct and impulse than on forethought. Now, I have an yeah. interesting question for you guys. Do you think that without Lieutenant Exley, you know, Guy Pierce's character, he could have solved this case on his own? Uh, I'll answer outright no. I think he could have come close, but without without them joining forces, I don't think either of them. Exley, maybe you could say on the surface, would have, could have, would and could have solved it on his own. But I think the fact, like the whole point was that they could only do that. They could only get the hundred percent, you know, piece together by working together. Yeah, I mean, I, that was the whole point. I would say. I think uh, Exley was kind of on the verge of figuring, or at least you know, getting most of the story figured out uh, towards the end of the movie when Russell Crowe finds him in the records room and, you know, uh, and, and he's l- looking through the cases and he's piecing together that Dudley, the chief, uh, Dudley Smith, mm-hmm. right, was behind it the whole time. Um, at that point, he kind of had it. However, I don't know if he could have survived, you know, the ensuing, the like, onslaught that was to come mm-hmm. without, you know, they couldn't have survived that without each other. Well... <clears throat> But in a sense, like I, I, I think it's kind of a subversion on the brains and brawn. Uh, yeah, like, I agree with that. A partnership because, really, Russell Crowe, uh, Bud White, comes close uh, uh, to like piecing this together. But it, it's a big conspiracy, so I, I don't think he quite could have grasped the entire thing. Right. He would have just been kind of flailing in the dark. Mm. Uh, or would have focused on one detail and not seen the big yeah. picture. I agree with that. But mm-hmm. the very fact that he does focus on those uh one details does lead him down the path so i think it's i think it's a, overall a fantastic arc he has he starts getting confidence in himself he, his morality like he's a very moral person but the way for it, certain things the way he enacts his morality changes right he has his, he has a specific code that he follows mm-hmm. for sure and uh when working for the uh the ca- uh, the lieutenant or the captain who is running basically a mob ring that morality starts to get challenged and I, I think it's like a, a very perfect simple arc for what is kind of a simple character mm. and an, uh, a second question do you think it's a cop out that he survived at the end? No, not really it's a fine arc for him You know, I, actually I think that's somewhat of, maybe of a subversion unto itself, like yeah you, you, you're set up to believe that he, you know, he goes out in a blaze of glory like you're sort of quote unquote redeeming himself and at that point, having become partners and friends with Guy Pierce, but no, I, I don't think it's a cop out. I think it's a fine ending. I think it's, it's it, it wraps up very nicely and, and it makes sense to everything else that they that they set up beforehand. I, honestly, I don't know. <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if it did much for the movie that he was alive. So in that sense, it might have been a bit of a cop out. Just to say, like, y- you know, he got shot in the face. In the cheek. Actually, if you look at yeah, if you I know it, it, it does it it does show it in in that in this shot where he. Gets shot. Yes. Um, it you know it shows him getting shot in the cheek, but there's no real. It doesn't add anything to the movie that mm-hmm. he's alive. I, don't I think, think it's a fine coda. I think it's not a cop out to answer your original question is all. All right, let's move on to uh, Lieutenant Exley. Would anyone like to give a brief overview of the character? Talk about him. Um, yeah, well, he starts off as kind of a Boy Scout, and mm-hmm. uh, he's really wants to follow the letter of the law, you know, to the T. Uh, the entire time, and throughout the film, just as Russell Crowe's code, just as Bud White's code is getting challenged throughout the movie, so is Exley's, mm. and they're both finding that there's no like to live on the extremes of you know being a cop is kind of not the way that it's 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 hard to live that way. And um, as he quickly finds out, yeah. Well, exactly. There's always something that's going to challenge the way that you, the way that you operate. May I just say that Bud White would be a very unfortunate name to have in this day and age. <laughs> yeah, as well. Actually, his yeah. name is Webley or whatever. Like, uh, well, that's the unfortunate name, yeah. as well. <laughs> regardless of what age it is. But yes, I'll oh, go on. You got anything else? No, I was. I was going to say, yeah, um, yeah. I like what you said. Uh, yeah, he's set up to be the Boy Scout, right? So he's he's of course an idealist to begin with. He's you know I want to do the right thing and become a cop because my father got you know he he has a he explains that backstory his motivation for becoming a police officer later on. But it all makes sense. And yeah, he's very idealist, but he quickly learns, as is shown, you know, the reality of working in the department. He he can't quite you know live to the ideas he thought he was going to have to or, or set up to go to. So he becomes more—it's more of idealism versus pragmatism, 
sort of uh, also like we said we said sometimes academic versus practical as well you know sure on the surface it's great to like i'll be the best police officer and i'll follow everything i'll do everything by the book etc but the reality of that he that he finds out is you just sometimes you have to bend it, work around it or at least work right. with someone who is willing to do that and, and accept that yeah, i never believed the character's strict morality he sold out his well but they're bad guys but he sold out police officers for his own personal gain yes that's true and at the end he does it does again. the same thing true. in fact everything that he fought for in now again you can argue that he's doing the greater good by preserving the integrity of the police force and that he did uh, exercise the uh, corruption in it but again he's using it to his own personal gain I see him almost becoming the next Dudley Smith <laughs> I somewhat I see what you mean. I, I of course yes. Like uh, when he um, does the thing uh, with the Christmas party, and testifies against his officers. Yes, he's doing it for personal gain. But he's sort of even not even lampshade. They, a character says that like you're a good politician, so it's sort of like a bonus, like a side effect. Yes, he's purging the corruption, but also he's furthering himself. And yes, he's furthering his career, and that also is sort of bookended at the end there too. I think perhaps maybe that's what they're going for. Like you, they they hint at that I don't know if they really intended that but you could get that out of it I, I like that that angle on it though I don't quite agree with that uh, yes he uses the situations that he finds himself in to his personal advantage however when he finds out that there was something going wrong with the Night Owl murder case uh, Bud says to him you want to this made you you want to destroy everything that that you know you've been working for and he says with a wrecking ball and he immediately goes and, and does that even though he thinks it's going to ruin his career basically That's or get him killed but to that point I, I feel it's kind of a slippery slope almost because over the course he has that strict morality that he has to practice right and that you can't just kill bad guys you need to arrest them and have them prosecuted and he gives that one that his moral code is dashed at the end when he decides to kill uh Captain Smith yeah. uh, to make sure so in a sense how different is that, like yes Dudley Smith is that extreme version of it but in a sense he's protecting like, I like to see why he started this did Dudley Smith go into this entire extortion scheme and he was fighting off criminals coming into his city so I, I like to actually see more of that story mm. sort of of a mm. kind of that the fall of Captain Smith the was he always a bad guy that. mm. yeah that's interesting yeah sure and it, I could see like maybe not but I could see the, the kind of a bittersweet ending that he well could. they did have records of going back like 15 years or whatever when or 12 years I think when they said in the talking, film yeah of him records of him like murdering people basically like the other two murdering people for him and him signing off on it yeah, he took advantage of a situation that was presented to him I, I don't see like I, I think it, the, you could argue the bittersweet ending there I, I think I agree with you to, like you could, as I said you definitely get hints of that like I like that it's it's kind of sprinkled throughout there that maybe you could take it that way but maybe not so it's sort of like less open ended I, I do like that uh, angle though as I said I think it's interesting. I, I also agree that it would be interesting that they should make a, a story about, you know, Captain Smith's uh, <laughs> history, if you will. Uh, pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I think we covered most of uh, actually Jack Vincennes. Uh, I, I think that... Um, what's his name? Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey is a phenomenal job. He's my favorite character, and I'll tell you why in a sec. He just has all these, like, quirky mannerisms of, like, being this hot shot, like, mm -hmm. kind of Hollywood character... Hollywood Jack, and it's it's beautiful because he ha he has perhaps the greatest arc of all of the characters there. That he's a corrupt, poli not really corrupt, he's but not a really lazy corrupt. policeman. Mm -hmm. um, he works with tabloids to get like good collars and gets paid off for them, so they could kind of the mutual ben uh, beneficial relationship. Right. He works on a television show. He doesn't really care about true policing, and then. You slowly see him develop over the... And Kevin Spacey has a phenomenal job of developing this character. That he starts to question why he became a police, uh, policeman. And if he can actually look himself uh, himself in the mirror anymore. Right. And then he decides to become a good police officer. Finally do, do some real He's sort of somewhat work. forced to. But like at first he's forced into it because yeah. of the you know, circumstances. But, to, but then he, he truly like gets into it. I, I agree with that, of course. I think that reminds him of yeah. why he wanted to be a police officer in the end. Right. Agreed. And... It gets him killed, and uh, it's, it's it's such a like kind of tragic ending. Mm -hmm. But it's an impetus for the his arc 
actually completes because he does solve the crime, even though it leads to his death. Uh, like it's it's phenomenally well done. It's a nice twist uh, the first time you watch it. I, yeah. I definitely agree. He, he's he's my favorite character in this film, and yeah, like again, like you know, him and the other two have very nicely, like perfectly, in fact, drawn arcs. As you get the initial setup, like I said, his initial setup, he's at a party and he's dancing with a you know, very attractive lady. He's like, you know, uh, I actually do real police work, you know, but he doesn't really like the whole point. He, he he uses his own image to propel himself, and he's not he's not actually a cop anymore. He's basically, you know, the, he's the face of publicity for the police station, and like, yeah, that furthers his career, if you will. But then he's because of again the, the Christmas fight, then he's forced to, you know, in, the slap on the wrist they give him. To, to appease the you know the public and he's shipped back to I think he works in narcotics and he's shipped back to Vice yes, instead right right so then he sort of stumbles into a real case he's the one who finds uh, the Florida lease uh, business card if you remember mm-hmm. like that's, and he also has the connections with the, like uh, with, with like kind of the shady areas so that they can get yeah. a lead on the night out exactly shows. exactly so yeah so then he starts to sort of he realizes as you said he realizes that. And he also has a, a nice, a very nice discussion with the uh, Romo Tomasi thing, mm-hmm. like you know Guy Pierce, like so, it, it's sort of like Ro- Rolo Tomasi, whatever. It sort of like shakes him into like realizing, you know, perhaps want to be doing real police work now, not just like being a showman for it instead. So yeah, I agree. He has a great arc and he has great scenes. Um, every time he's in a, interacting at a party or something, like he's just fantastic. And you can see he has, and as you said, he has a perfect arc as the redemp- or his own redemption tale plus the impetus that sort of like is the final piece of the puzzle in the overarching um, you know corruption case yeah Spacey does a wonderful like terrific job um, it, co- it comes like it goes all the way down to like his little I think you mentioned this earlier again but his little like mannerisms that he does like you know somebody's like hey aren't you uh, Hollywood <laughs> Hollywood Jack or whatever and he like gives him a little like gun the bloody know. Jesus <laughs> yeah basically actually you know? One of my favorite versions of that is uh, towards the end when he's totally like become a cop as he's walking downstairs. Someone goes, "Just the facts, Jack," and the look he has like in the distance of his face of hearing that and how like, sort of disgusted with himself it, yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah. Over it he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful like. Agreed. Yeah, Kevin Spacey does a great. It's job a perfect touch. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I've, I've always thought he's a good actor and, and they gave him you know he, he had a great script to work with with uh, with this film I don't have too much to add I think you guys both went into it a lot but like just the way that he, he I mean his arc is kind of oh, I really like his arc because it's completely different than the other two the other two kind of intersect and his is like he's kind of off in his own world and goes through all of his own types of like you know discoveries and, and changes and things like that which Ex- is really interesting. Exley and um, and White are sort of on a Venn diagram, right? Arc. Like they, they converge eventually. Whereas, as you said, um, Jack Vincennes is sort of tangential to them, but still like necessary. Like he's still related, but yeah, he's on his own. He's following his own path, right. which happens to intersect with theirs at the end. And in fact, uh, indirectly, you know, sort of he he provides the final clue mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, I think they're all integral to getting to where this movie gets to you know well on that note uh, this is uh, do you have something uh, well are you going are you to discuss Danny DeVito as a no we're discussing character? next okay uh, fair enough yeah. so teaser so th- there's a thing that when you like a movie there's actually not much to say about it you gush for a yeah, little yeah. bit we just then... said why it was so great and yeah. there's nothing to really to detract from it if there was we would have given that a zero or something and said about it but but the really... reason we want to set this up is so that for the next episode we can actually go into the depths uh, with what this movie does correct and what True Detective Season 2 failed because there's we, we've been discussing this for a, a little while now that there's direct point for point there are many direct parallels yeah uh, like plot and character like one to one ratios mm-hmm. between the two and what went right and what went wrong so tune in next time and we're going to go into in depth over why True Detective is such a failure we'll tie, it all, tie them both together like it's, it's like this it's the Byzantine plot of these mm-hmm. two major plots coming together yeah, exactly. for one awesome That's what I was going finale. For. So uh, I'm Jonathan E. Menzer with Scott Thurlow. See you then. And see you soon. Have a good one. We'll catch you next time. This has been Bon Mott's. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Music by Chris Morgan. Editing and engineering by Scott Thurlow. This has been a Los Angeles production. All rights reserved. <laughs>